What I'd like to do is, is uh, take you through some things and show you some animations. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you'll come to a bit of an understanding about some of the fascinating things that are going on inside our bodies right now in every single living cell uh, that we have. It's ju it'll just blow your mind when you see some of this stuff. So let me see if I can uh, make this thing work. There we go. By the way, anybody in the room recognize anything that looks like their email address up here? Is that one? Would you help me fix that later? Just after, after we're done, fantastic. Because they bounced back to me. Obviously, it didn't work, so I'd like to get that fixed. Um, OK, good. All right. Um, OK, what Darwin didn't know. Um, my premise again, and that's the whole premise of reasons to believe, is that if God wrote the book of Scripture through Holy Spirit inspiration, and he also wrote the book of nature through creation, then, I'm a computer scientist, guys, then both books should agree, right? Does that make sense? Same author, should be the same story. And not only that, but the more we learn, the more the books will agree. Makes sense, right? Okay, so the questions for today is, what is Darwin's theory of evolution? Does it stand up to scientific scrutiny? And, sorry, there was a third bullet there. I went too fast. And what didn't Darwin know, okay? So I'm gonna go kinda quick, but what I'd like to do is ask you if, you, if you have a question, if I just said something that you don't understand, just shoot your hand up, we can stop, and I can get right back on track again. I'd rather answer your question than let you spend a minute or two thinking about that question and missing everything else that's following, okay? So please feel free to interrupt. Okay, so here's the story, the, the overview of the theory of evolution, and I'm gonna try to do this as much justice as I can. Uh, that's an actual copy of the, or a picture of the cover of the book titled The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now that's a wonderful subtitle, isn't it? But that's what the book was called. So what the theory of evolution basically talks about is descent with modification, okay? And what that means is that populations evolve over the course of generations through a process of natural selection. Natural, I'm sorry, uh, Darwin defined evolution as the idea that species change over time, they give rise to new species, and they share a common ancestor. So as a result of all that put together, you've all seen pictures that kind of look like this. I know it's a little bit of an eye chart from the distance, but pictures of various animals, you know, supposedly the tree of life, right? You've seen the, we've, I learned this in high school, I'm sure, right? They still teach it, it's the tree of life, okay? And the mechanism that Darwin proposed for evolution is called natural selection. And natural selection uh, is basically the idea that resources are limited in nature, organisms with heritable traits, that just means something that can be inherited, okay? Organisms with heritable traits that favor survival and reproduction will tend to leave more offspring than their peers, causing the traits to increase in frequency over generations, okay? You get this idea that there's long periods of time have to be kind of at the underpinning of this notion. So natural selection causes populations to become adapted or increasingly well-suited to their environments over time. Okay, that's, what the, that's the mechanism, the natural selection mechanism. Okay. Natural selection depends on the environment, because the environment can cause ch changes to want to be made, and it also depends on uh, and requires existing heritable var variation in a group. Okay? So those two things are necessary. So I looked at the Tree of Life slide, and I asked the question, what happens before what's in that little green box right there? It says origin of life. I know it's hard to see. The little green box is origin of life. And my first question is, well, what happens right before that? Okay? And so here's the answer to that question. Chemistry happens before that. Not biochemistry, chemistry. Think high school chemistry class, mixing the sulfur with the sulfuric acid, with the hydrogen making hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs, all that stuff. Chemistry is all that existed, okay? So Darwin's theory starts with the 
presence of life. Once you have life, then this idea of successive adaptation and creating change and, multi and uh, eventually creating new species, that idea comes into play. But his theory means absolutely nothing before life exists. Because again, all you have is chemistry, and only chemistry, right? And chemistry has no goal. It has no goal whatsoever, right? Chemistry is just chemistry. Whatever happens randomly and in nature is simply going to happen. And so the idea of life coming from non-life is called abiogenesis. A meaning without, and biogenesis, the creation of life, okay? So, where, how, and when did the first single-celled animal exist? And that's kind of a key question for me. Darwin himself had no idea, and he admits that. In fact, one of his peers, a gentleman named Ernst Haeckel, who um, was a German scientist who heavily promoted Darwin's theory after he wrote his book, um, wrote this back in 1882. Uh, he, was, he was commenting on radiolarians. By the way, it has nothing to do with radio. Radiolarians are actually protozoans, uh, very small protozoans that produce intricate mineral skeletons, and we can see these things in the fossil record. Okay, So here's what Heckel said. Actually, as early as 1862, Heckel included a footnote in his monograph on radiolarians to severely stress, quote, the chief defect of the Darwinian theory is that it throws no light on the origin of the primitive organism, probably a simple cell from which all the others have descended. This is part of the idea that somehow a cell formed in nature and all subsequent life followed that. That's the idea, okay? So Darwin didn't address the origin for sure in his book. In fact, in 1871, now his book came out in 59, right? So some tw almost uh, what 18 years, 15 years later or so, he writes this uh, to a friend of his named Joseph Hooker. He speculated that the first spark of light may have come and taken place in, quote, a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, et cetera, present that a protein, spelled wrong, but uh, a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. That was the closest that he got some number of years after he wrote his book. So today, you know, we hear that, you know, evolution talks about, well, life was created in the, in the primordial soup. You've heard that term before, the primordial soup. And uh, that's where that idea came from. Right, this notion of a warm little pond of goo that somehow generates a cell. Okay, so in the 1950s, scientists envisioned a primordial atmosphere devoid of oxygen. It was made up mostly of reducing gases. This is what they thought: a reducing gases like hydrogen, ammonia, methane, and water vapor were thought to dominate. Russian scientists speculated that energy discharges within this gas mix formed simple organic prebiotic molecules, prebiotic meaning before life, right? That accumulated in Earth's oceans and enriched the primordial soup, where presumably chemical reactions led stepwise to life's first form, okay? So a gentleman named Stanley Miller, about 1953, he, uh, shown here in this picture, by the way, provided what many considered at the time the very first experimental verification of this hypothesis. By passing an electrical discharge through a reducing gas mixture in the laboratory, Miller produced several amino acids and other organic compounds. His success launched the entire industry called origin of life research. Okay? We learned about Miller's experience in high school, right? The test tube that created the, the building block, the building blocks for life. By the way, there's a there are like 20 different amino acids that are crucial to life. He was able to create four of them in a very controlled environment with a mixture that you're going to see in a minute is not accurate because there is strong evidence revealing a primordial atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, and water. And that, that, that we know from the, from the rocks, the, the geological record, right? Um, in four billion year old zircon, show what the atmosphere was actually made of, pretty much like today's, but without the 21% level of free oxygen that we enjoy. 
this atmosphere would be destructive to the biochemistry that origin of life scenarios require. Because of this, Miller's experiment is largely irrelevant. Now here's the sad but true. Very few textbooks today acknowledge that most origin of life researchers consider Miller's experiment irrelevant. They just ignore it. They still teach the experiment and, and, and what, a, what a great thing it was. But in May, on May 2nd of 2003, in the issue of Science, Jeffrey Beta and Antonio Lascano, Miller's longtime collaborators, acknowledged the change in perspective even as they commemorated the 50th anniversary of that renowned experiment. While explaining the experiment's historical interest, Beta and Lascano commented, quote, contemporary geoscientists tend to doubt that the primitive atmosphere had the highly reducing composition used by Miller in 1953. These are his partners saying, eh, we weren't right. We, we, we had a, a supposition that was incorrect, okay? So, the gas mixture does not yield organic compounds in a laboratory prebiotic simulation experiment, and this has been a devastating blow to the evolutionary scenario. In fact, there are now, there are many evolutionists who are looking to find the true, the, a better alternative than Darwin to describe how evolution took place. That, that's just the fact. So in reality, what we have is, and I have to do the audio because, because uh, we don't have it going through the system yet, but the guy says, no soup for you. You wanna say that again? I do. Here we go, let me see if I can do it. Maybe, no, I can't, anyway. So there's no soup. There is no primordial soup, uh, so there's little to no chance that chemistry somehow created a living cell by random processes, right? But you know what the difficulty is for all of us? The difficulty is we're here. It happened. Somehow it happened. And those who refuse to think or, or refuse to, to put a creator in the scene are stuck with trying to figure out how it happened. Yet it's against all odds. There, it's, it's virtually impossible. So how do we know this? Well, I'm gonna show you some things that you're gonna be amazed by. The complexity that's present in living cells, okay? Um, so let's start first with what, what did Darwin see? So on the left-hand side, you see a picture of one of his 15 or so microscopes. Uh, you can see by today's standards, a pretty primitive device. And on the right-hand side, you see probably a better picture than what he actually saw through that instrument, okay? But, but close, we're just gonna say that's close. And that, those happen to be plant cells that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. You can't tell a whole lot of stuff about that by looking at that picture. So Darwin cited an article by G.H. Lewis at the time when he said that the cell is complex in part because it has a membrane, a nucleus, and a nucleolus. That's the complexity that Darwin saw when he looked at his cells. He saw three things, okay? Hold on to your seats. Uh, that was the sum total, okay. So let me ask you a question. Who knows what that is? That's DNA, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid, right? DNA, we'll just call it DNA. So two strands of DNA form a 3D structure called a double helix. We've all heard of the double helix. And when illustrated, the DNA looks like a spiral ladder in which the base pairs are the rungs. So those things that are going in between the outer edges, those are the rungs. There's two base pairs on each one of those, one on one side and one on the other side. And the sugar phosphate groups make up the DNA backbone. That's the outside thing that wraps around, okay? So a collection of nucleotides makes a DNA molecule. Each nucleotide contains three components, a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen base. So there's only four different bases, uh, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And they're abbreviated as ATGC. Those are the letters of DNA coding. You've seen those before, right? And uh, the sugar in DNA is called 2-deoxyribose, and these sugar molecules alternate with the phosphate groups making up the backbone of the DNA strand. So I didn't know that, that sugar and phosphate are, in, are intermingled along the backbone of the DNA. So it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, but DNA wasn't actually discovered until 1953 when James Watson and Francis Crick published their findings. But here's the thing, I'm a computer scientist, this is starting to get into my wheelhouse now. DNA is information. Where did that information come from? 
Did it come from the primordial ooze? How does information come from the primordial ooze? I don't fully understand that, but, but DNA is information. And I'll tell you a few other things uh, in a couple of slides that will fascinate you about this. So there are about 20,000 genes in every human cell. So DNA, all the, the entire strands of DNA are one gene followed by another gene followed by another gene. And a gene is of various lengths along that DNA segment. DNA instructions are used to make proteins in the cell. Okay, and I've got that video that I was showing earlier. It's, it's going to blow your mind when you see how these molecular machines actually work. But before we get there, I want to give credit to Dr. Drew Berry, uh, who is uh, down in Australia, and he started out as uh, in the field of microsc microscopy, which is uh, the study, you know, the use of microscopes to see, you know, finer and finer detail in various things. And uh, he got to a point where uh, he is now the um, animations manager, the, the biolog biomedical animations manager at this institute in um, Australia. And I'm sorry that I can't give you the audio for this because listening to him explain it is a whole lot better than what I'm going to do. But I want you to watch this, and I know enough about it to, to help you understand it. Uh, so let's hit the button and watch this thing run. That's the DNA strand, right? And what he talks about is it actually, inside our cells, it's, uh, our cells create a production system. What's happening is the DNA strand is coming in from the left-hand side as it's, as it's double helix. And it's being ripped apart by one of those, that blue thing right there. It's coming, I'm sorry, now it's coming in from the front, okay? It's coming in from the front and it's getting ripped apart. And the one side of the DNA that gets ripped apart can be copied directly as it is in line. But the other side of the DNA has to be all the way through this machine and flipped around because it has to be copied backwards. <laughs> so it takes a second strand and it replicates it backwards. Billions of these machines are whirring away right now copying DNA right inside our bodies with remarkable fidelity. This is a digital system. Does everybody remember uh, phonographs and making cassette tape copies or reel-to-reel -reel copies of music. Uh, I'm a musician, so I did a lot of that, right? And you remember how after you copied a, a, a song four or five times onto a tape, it just got worse and worse and worse? Because the signal-to-noise ratio got worse. There was less signal and more noise. So uh, on the fifth generation copy, instead of hearing in a God of the Vita, what you heard was because it was all noise, right? So. This is a digital system. It's remarkable fidelity. It copies exactly. The output equals exactly the input. Think about that for a minute. And so then the DNA wraps itself up into these little bundles. And there's names for all this stuff, but none of the names are, are necessary. And the bundle is called a chromosome. OK? And now we're going to zoom out a little bit. As we look, as we're, we're still, all of this happens inside the nucleus of the cell, right? That's a pore that we just came through, an entry gateway that, put, that allows the right things in and out and doesn't allow the, the wrong things in and out of the nucleus, right? And then what happens is, as you've seen this probably before, how the cells divide. You see how the chromosomes are all gathering up together? They're going to the left side and they're going to the right side. And in a second, it's going to be kind of pulled apart. And then, and then get this. This is kind of fascinating. Imagine that the cell membrane is a balloon. And your job is to turn one balloon into two balloons. Do you have any idea how you might do that without breaking the balloon? No, well, it's figured out for us. So they divide, right? They divide. And now we have two exact copies of the cell. Those machines are fascinating. Now watch this. There's more even more molecular machines, okay? So what we're gonna do is rewind the tape just a little bit and just revel in the intricacy of the machines that are inside the cells. Chromosomes are the biggest molecular structures inside of us. And in a minute, you can see how the, this is what they call, is it still running? Did it stop? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, there we go, okay, just pause. Okay, so we've got this, you see the little whisker-like things on the left and the right side? This is called the dynamic scaffolding, or these, it, they're actually called microtubules, okay? Again, built by proteins in the cell. And these, 
when parts have to be shipped from where they're made to where they're consumed, these microtubules tubules form, and, and, and when the cell is ready, right, it, there's a tension sensing capability in this, in this mechanism that senses when it's time for it to divide, right? So, so Dr. Berry is talking a lot about the microtubules themselves, but watch what happens in just a second. You're gonna see these little micro machines, molecular machines, they're gonna be walking along these microtubules implementing effectively a broadcast system. It's absolutely fascinating. Signals are being transmitted. Now watch this. So the, so the red part is while the cell is still making all of the things necessary so it can, all the copies necessary so it can split, right? And the red's gonna turn green in just a few seconds. As you can see, that's starting to happen. And that means that things are getting ready for the cell to actually divide. But watch this these little machines that actually carry necessary parts along the microtubules. And this is going on billions of times right now in your body, in, in cells. Isn't this something? I mean, it looks like something out of a cartoon, doesn't it? But Dr. Berry and, and other scientists, they look to him. He is the, the foremost expert on how all this stuff is working. I mean, this is what this guy does. He's made his life work doing this. Yes. That's, okay, so here's the issue, okay? Uh, this is Dr. Barry chatting, but uh, yeah. So here's the issue. The, the proteins that are made are so small, they're smaller than the wavelength of light. You can't take a picture of it, right? Um, but they can study the, the, the small parts and they can put this together understanding how it's working by using scanning electron microscopes that don't, you know, that have a, the ability to see the, the finer detail. So it's not actual, and I don't want anybody to think that this is actual photograph. This is an animation that represents how these things work as best we can tell today. And he is in the biomedical business. He is not in the uh, theology business, okay? Just so you know what his background is, okay? Um, yeah, molecular clockwork is one of the comments that he makes during his, during his comment. Molecular clockwork, I like that. So, there's another interesting aspect to this, to DNA, from an information science perspective. DNA is the most efficient method known for storing digital information today. And scientists are looking at how they can use DNA to store vast amounts of information. Their estimates today are that if they're successful, they could store the entire sum of the world's knowledge in the volume of about two pickup trucks. So imagine how much volume a pickup trucks take today, right? Two of those would store every single bit of information that's known to human beings if we were able to use DNA as a storage mechanism. We can't do that with solid state uh, electronics today, not at all. But to imp just to give you an idea, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's, it's a little, you know, computer science-y, but it kind of fascinated me, so I want to share it with you. But <laughs> this is really cool how this, how this stuff works. Based on the previous um, base, like if, you, if the previous base were a T, and we encode the information into a 0, 1, or a 2, so three digits, which is called a trit, a, a bit binary digit, a trit is a trinary digit, okay? Based on the previous digit, if the, if the new value that's coming in is a zero, then the next uh, base used would be the, the A base, or the adenine base, okay? If the previous digit were a G, then, uh, and, and the next digit coming in were a one, then an A would be used there as well, okay? So that's what that chart's representing. So I think it's just kind of fascinating that there's this mechanism inside our bodies that would be capable of storing so much information and do it so efficiently that it completely blows away the second closest, but next efficient storage system. It's just fascinating stuff. And it all came out of the primordial loop. So, complexity, irreducible complexity. This is a concept I'd like to share with you so that you're aware of what it is. It was defined by Dr. Michael Behe in a book in 1996 called Darwin's Black Box, okay? 
And the definition is this, a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function of the system, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning, okay? Irreducibly complex. In other words, whatever complexity it is, every single part is necessary. There is no redundancy, right? Take out one part and the entire thing stops working, okay? So let's take an example of a mouse trap. And um, I had planned that Dr. Behe would explain it to you, but he is going to, he'll, he'll do the, the uh, video part and I'll do the audio part. So he takes a simple mouse trap and he talks about how it's got five fundamental parts to it, right? It's got a wooden base, it's got a catch, it's got a hammer, it's got a spring, okay? And what he's gonna describe is if you, if you take any one of those away, the mouse trap will fail to work. So what does that mean like from an evolutionary perspective? It means that all of those parts would have to assemble at the same time, in the same place, just right, in order for that thing to work, right? So every time you take another thing that's required to make a system, right, and add it to it, you increase the complexity of that system and you reduce your chances of that happening significantly, right? And that's only five parts. There's 20,000 parts inside our cells that make our cells work, okay? So I'm gonna just move past that and let me show you another um, nano machine or a molecular machine. This is being described by um, uh, Stephen Meyer, Stephen C. Meyer, Dr. Stephen C. Meyer. And he is going to show you the flagellum on some simple bacteria, the, the flagella motor, okay? This motor, is unbelievable. In fact, you're gonna see what looks like a motor that we would design, right? The humans would design in just a few seconds, and he's gonna talk about it. So this, uh, this machine is essentially a rotary engine that moves the bacteria through its liquid, okay? It has, and here's an here's a, uh, animation of it, it has a rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, a U-joint, and a whip-like tail that functions as a propeller, okay? And it can run, in some of these bacteria, it runs at 100,000 RPM, and in a quarter of a turn, it can reverse direction to another 100,000 RPM. I tried going from 2,000 RPM in my truck down the street one day into reverse in 2,000 RPM, and I get to go down tomorrow and pick it up from the transmission shop. <laughs> Here's, uh, here's a diagram, there's the, they're showing the reversal in less than a quarter of a turn. So how did all of these parts come together to form this motor? Uh, how did that happen? I mean, when you look at this, it looks designed to me, right? It just looks designed. So, so that's the flagella motor and that's also documented in Dr. Behe's book. So here's what, here's what Darwin said. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Okay, um, what do you think? Are those molecular machines irreducibly complex? Did they evolve slowly over time? What was the motivation? How did they go from one thing to the whole thing that's necessary to make each one of those machines do its job? It's a tough one, that's why they're looking for a better explanation. So, simple single-celled life, as we know from my previous chat back in January, appeared about 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. Uh, and remember, its job was to make oxygen to clear up the atmosphere, remember that? The whole discussion about day four when the lights in the sky showed up? It's not that they were created on day four, they were already there. It's just that now the atmosphere had thinned to the point where we could actually see from the surface of the earth, you could actually see some of that light coming, coming in. So these animals that were doing that for quite some time. In fact, for about three billion years, they are doing this, okay? But as soon as the earth got to about 8% oxygen level, something called the Avalon explosion of life occurred. And this yielded sponges and jellyfish and some other things of the like, okay? Interestingly, interestingly though, uh, there was a mass extinction event about 33 million years later, and a, a lot of them died off. We still have some, but a lot of them died off. But very, very shortly thereafter, the Cambrian explosion of life 
happened, creating the vast majority of the animal body plans we have today. Animal body plans meaning horses, cats, dogs, you know, crickets, uh, you name it. It's, each one of them has a body plan that's, that's different from other body plans, okay? And there seems to be no connection between the Avalon animals and the Cambrian animals. Those two explosions of life produce like completely different kinds of things, all right? In fact, here's a slide I borrowed from a presentation online. During the Cambrian explosion, all but one of the major marine phyla appeared on the planet. All but one of them. That's a pretty big explosion of life. And, and here's something, well, oh, sorry, let me back up one. Okay, see the chart on the left? It's a little hard to read, but uh, it shows that flat line, the red line down at the bottom, uh, running over to the right-hand side for about three or so billion years. And then all of a sudden, plants, plants appear. The single-celled animals appear. And uh, the, the photo, photosynthesis begins. Living cells appear at about 4 billion years or so. And it stays like that for a very, very long period of time. And then once the plants show up, then we hit the, the, um, the Cambrian explosion, and all these various animals show up. In fact, the, the, uh, they're only separated by 33 million years. And that, the width of that blue box on the diagram is about 575 million years, okay? So Avalon explosion, 33 million years later, the Cambrian explosion, and all of that happens within that blue box. So geologically speaking, geologists and paleontologists will say this is essentially like at the blink of an eye in geologic time, okay? Yet, um, this is how evolution is often pictured, right? You've seen these kinds of charts before. I think I see my second cousin about three off the right there on the left-hand side. I'm not sure. Kind of looks like him. <laughs> oh, that's Jim. Oh, that's, there is a saxophone right there, isn't there? How about that? I think this type of diagram is extremely misleading. And I just zoomed in to the lower left-hand corner. All right? And I'm sorry it's hard to read, but a little fuzzy when you zoom in. But so. Let's just take the guy on the left for a second, okay? So the idea is that the guy on the left turns into the guy on the right, the second person in line. That's the idea, right? Doesn't it stand to reason, based on the definition of evolution, that there were very many small changes that took the guy on the left to the guy next to him? A lot of small changes? And here's the issue, folks. Those fossils don't exist in the fossil record. Those would be called transitional forms, okay? The transitional forms, meaning as, as animal A becomes animal B, okay? And they don't exist. Uh, there should be innumerable, innumerable variations because the theory teaches that changes happen one at a time, very slowly over long periods of time. So, but this is in fact a continuous stream of production of body types that we should still be witnessing today if this was all true. Bill. Yeah. So yeah, Bill's comment uh, for the for the broadcast is that um, Darwin himself said that over time the the uh, paleontologists will discover in the fossil record that all of these transitional forms existed, and if they don't then my theory will be proven wrong. Guess what? They haven't found these transitional forms in the fossil record. They do not exist. There was a little bit of a flap about a, a bird that had a, a dinosaur, a flying dinosaur that had feather-like features, and that's called Archaeopteryx. And there was a little bit of flap about that. I think it was in the 70s or so. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, that's it? That's all you got? So why is it that we have only dis uh, fossils of distinct models, right? Each one of these at the bottom or at the top is a distinct model, a distinct body. Why is it we have just fossils of those and not all the transitional forms? Um, so Darwin said, if by this theory innumerable transitional forms must have existed, why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? That's actually Charles Darwin saying, why don't we see them? And that leads right to what Bill just said, which is so he, he, he made sure that his charges understood you have to go out there and find these things. Because if you don't, I'm not right about what I'm telling you, right? And this whole thing is called Darwin's Dilemma. 
Well, you've heard of this before. Okay. Well, let me show you evolution of a different kind. This is the evolution of the Corvette. Hmm. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I use the same word, but it has a different meaning, doesn't it? Surely it's the evolution of the Corvette, right? But the Corvette, as we know, that was designed by people, right? Um, but let me ask you this. Do you kind of see similarities between the two pictures? One is just showing a progression from one to the next to the next. They both show the progression from one to the next to the next, right? Yet everything on the right-hand side of this picture was designed. I might argue the same for everything on the left-hand side, but I'll leave that to the reader. Okay, so here's another thing that Darwin didn't know. We're cover he's, there's going to be about five things here before we get done. Uh, Darwin and others in his day thought that the sun's luminosity was constant since the beginning of life. But it turns out that astrophysics has revealed that that is not true. Today, the sun is actually about 19 to 24% more luminous than it was 3.8 billion years ago. Okay, now why? We can get into some detail, but essentially when a, when a star forms, it's hydrogen. I mean, yeah, it's hydrogen, and it's burning up its hydrogen fuel, and it gets to the point where it's, where it's running very hot. That's why you see the red, the red line on the left-hand side of the chart going you know, vertically very quickly. And then it starts to come down as, as, it starts to, it's a, as fusion takes over in the core of the sun, and it starts to produce the heavier elements. We talked about the, ne the necessity of the heavy elements in the last time that we spoke, right? If it weren't for stars making the heavy elements, both in their engines and as when they go supernova, we wouldn't be here today because as Carl Sagan is, is you know, remembered as saying, we are all made of stardust, right? We are, we're, we're made from elements that were, fact, that were created in the factories of stars, right? But look at the luminosity as it dips down to like below 80% of, of uh, where it started out, and that entire block of time uh, called the microbial era, that's when all those animals, like the three billion years, they're in there cleaning up the air and creating oxygen, and um, there are a number of processes that are going on, and then there's a very brief period of time on the right-hand side that hits the animal era, and that's just about the time when the sun returns to just about 100% of the, of the uh, luminosity that we see today, right? So, so it's interesting, keep that number in mind, 19 to 24% more luminous today than it was 3.8 billion years ago. Is that a big deal? Well, let's take a look. If the sun's luminosity changed 2% today, all life on Earth would become extinct, okay? If a 1% change would happen, it would, cause, it would cause most advanced plants and animals to die off. A 1% change in the luminosity, if that happened today, we'd be gone. So both catastrophes were averted by a perfectly measured and timed drawdown of Earth's greenhouse gases combined with perfectly measured and timed change in Earth's reflectivity. That's called the albedo, by the way. Not, not that that's, not albi, albedo, right? Not libido, albedo. As the sun increased in brightness, the quantity of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere decreased and Earth's albedo changed so that the temperature on Earth remained optimal for the life at the time. So this was all orchestrated. And chemistry doesn't have any idea how to orchestrate this, right? It just doesn't. So ensuring that the just right kinds, diversity and abundance of life on Earth at just right times and places guarantee that greenhouse gases are removed from Earth's atmosphere at just right rates to compensate for the sun's increasing luminosity. Do you get that feeling of just rightness in there? We talked about the fine tuning of the universe. Then now we're talking about the fine tuning of the development of life on the planet. If you will, the terraforming of this ball of rock covered in an ocean with a thick layer of clouds uh, keeping, keeping all light out of it and how that got turned into the beautiful place that it is today. Furthermore, life is so abundant and ubiquitous on Earth's surface that it substantially affects Earth's albedo, both altering the cloud cover and the reflectivity of Earth's surface, right? So there's so much. It's not just a little bit of life. It's a lot of life. Um, there's a bunch of technical stuff here, and I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but 
there are a number of different cycles uh, that, I, that I'm going to take you through. And if you want, I can I can chat with you a little bit later about these, but um, such as the silic silicate carbonate cycle um, and some other factors. But there are there are four different ways in which the life actually compensates for the sun's changing luminosity, regulating the silicate carbonate cycle, altering the organic carbon burial rate changing the atmospheric chemistry and the cloud cover of the planet, as well as changing Earth's reflectivity. All of that working together is how life on Earth dealt with the changing of the sun's luminosity, which is going to happen in any star that is, that is first born. It's going to go through that process, that luminosity change. And unless all four of life's compensating factors are at just right levels at all times throughout the past 3.8 billion years, life on Earth could not thrive and most likely would not, we all would have gone extinct. It just simply wouldn't have happened. The presumed evolutionary processes that account for changes in life's diversity possess no inherent knowledge of the future physics of the sun. There's no predictiveness in randomness, right? There just isn't. So what didn't Darwin know? He didn't know how rapidly life appeared on Earth. He was very concerned about the Cambrian explosion of life, but he didn't know that the fossils, the transitional forms, would not be found. And he didn't know that there would not be anything between single-celled animals and then, boom, Avalon explosion and then Cambrian explosion. He had no idea. He thought all those things would be found. He did not know that the primordial soup didn't exist. He did not know that the intricate design of the molecular machine present in every living cell. He didn't have the benefit of seeing what we just saw. And he had no idea that information was contained in our cells in the form of DNA. He did not know that the fossil record would fail him in providing transitional forms. But as Bill pointed out correctly, he did say that if it doesn't back him up, then his theory would be wrong. And he did not know that evolution could have no inkling of the physics of the sun and how important that was, right? So as I put all this material together, it occurred to me that, that maybe, just maybe, if he had known any of that, we might not have a book called On Origin of Species, right? Just maybe. So that is uh, the information that I've got to share with you tonight. And I'd be more than happy to uh, take any, any questions. But here, let me do this so we actually capture the questions on the broadcast. Art, would you help me with this? Would you run the mic? Um, all you have to do is talk into it and then pass it on to the next person that wants to talk so that the folks on the, on the, on the um, video can hear. It's already on. Yep. OK. Uh, Hold you, it right up here. You might explain the difference between micro and macro evolution. evolution? Sure. sure. Because a lot of people. Uh, especially Christians have questions on this. Sure. So you might explain that difference. Yes, I'll be happy to. So macroevolution is the theory that we just got done talking about. Macroevolution, the idea that cats turn into dogs and dogs turn into goats and goats turn into donkeys and donkeys turn into horses and it goes on and on. That's called macroevolution. Okay. Microevolution, which I am pretty much a firm believer in, is the idea of adaptation that species adapt. Um, and Darwin's examples of this that kind of led to the whole ball of wax were, were uh, as he studied certain birds in the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that th this particular branch of birds, it was just like other birds, but they had much stronger and slightly more powerful beaks to crack the, the more difficult uh, nuts and things that they ate in their diet, right? And so he got to thinking that, gee, you know, uh, um, necessity is quite a mother, I guess, if we could say that, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, so the idea that we adapt is, I'm perfectly fine with the idea of microevolution because I think that the information was put into our DNA so that we could adapt, so that other animals could adapt their environment within some degree, right? We know that if, if all of a sudden if we have an ice age, we're all going to have a lot of trouble adapting to that. Right, um, So there are some things that can happen that adaptation is going to be thrown out the window. But that's uh, when people talk about microevolution, they're talking about these small changes in 
in um, what they call the phenotype, which is some observable characteristic of, of, uh, of an animal. Okay? When they talk about evolution, you need to ask them what type of evolution they're talking Macro about. Macro or micro. Yeah, because evolution, to some people, the word means the same thing. So when you talk to them and you explain, you know, a moth can change color. In other words, that's micro. micro. Right. And it's very important to let them know that Christians like us do believe in micro, but not micro. Um, not macro, right. Not macro, right. Yep. Any other questions? Bob, you said you had you were going to have a question for me. No, you answered it. Did I? Okay, so, so Bob told me that he was going to ask me, what was the most important thing that Darwin didn't know? And what would you guess I think that is? Anybody? What do you think? He thought that the cell was just a blob of blubber. True. True. And, and that's, that's along the lines of what I'm thinking. I think, had he any inkling that the cell's DNA was packed with so much information and that it gets replicated exactly during the course of a lifetime, cell after cell after cell gets, it's a digital copy, right? Had he known that, I, I just don't, I, because here's the fundamental thing for me. One either believes that the universe started with matter and energy, or it started with information. How does matter and energy alone create information? The only place where we see information come from is from a mind. Right? That's the only place, that's the only source of information we know of. I mean, if we were walking along the beach, let me give you the watchmaker example. If we were walking along the beach, doo -doo 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 -doo, and we stumbled across this, this uh, gold Rolex in the, in the sand, right? What's the first thing we're going to think? I know, I know what we're going to think. We're going to think, wow, the sea is fantastic. It manufactured a beautiful Rolex watch. No, that's not what we're going to think. We're going to think to ourselves, oh, somebody lost their watch that was created by another person, right? So when you look at some of these things that I was able to show you today, I mean, you know, you get to, you get to think about that and ponder. Yes, sir, hang on. Question? Uh, thank you, Gary. So why do scientists of today put so much emphasis on Darwin's theory if they have all of this information of modern day? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> why, why isn't every person that's here on the planet a believer in the Creator? I think the answer is the same answer, right? There are folks who are just going to be st stuck to an ideology. Um, there is a notion in science that we can't do science if we're going to allow uh, the divinity to come into the picture. But that's really not what the founders of modern science had intended. In fact, science kind of started out, you know, in the late 1500s, 1600s, the whole Renaissance period, with the idea that we are going to discover details about God's creation. That's how it got started, right? But somewhere along the line, you know, 1800s or so maybe, middle of the 1800s, I mean, think about the influences. We had Darwin, we had Karl Marx, right? Um, and we had Sigmund Freud, right? And this idea, this materialistic notion of the world was, was kind of, you know, science will learn all the answers. Uh, we don't have to rely on that, that old fable that there's a God in heaven that's out there, you know, generating all of these different things for us, right? And, and yet, and so what happened in my mind is they kind of abandoned the notion of let the data take you where it's going to take you to search for the truth, right? And to me, it's like it's just staring us in the face uh, what the right answer is. But there are people out there who you know, just while they're here, they're just not going to yield to that. I think. Pastor's not here anymore. Maybe he would have some insight that he could share. But that's a really good question. Sir. I might add that reasons to believe have thousands of scientists who are Christians. And there's a lot of people now who used to, people I know who are still atheist scientists who believe there is a causal agent. They believe there's something behind it because of all the fine-tuning law. They may not admit it's God of the Bible, but first of all, they really don't know what the Bible says. They only know science. They don't know the Bible and science both. 
we're fortunate to have hundreds of scientists who know the Bible and science That's as right. well. That's right. Yeah, at reasons.org, if you just spend a little bit of time as opposed to a YouTube, uh, you know, watching some music videos or whatever, as I know Bob McGregor likes to do. But um, yeah, check out reasons.org. There's a ton of information there. Bob? Just a couple of things I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, to your question is the having worked as an evangelist, that's where I'm coming from on that, that if you acknowledge the existence of a God, you instantly have some moral accountability, and that's the thing we're avoiding. The second part that I would like to add to that that puts it more on a biblical level, uh, you know, in, when I went through school, they talked about the missing link prior to man, and the interesting thing about that is, as you read the scriptures and the creation story, at every place it says, and God created something after its own kind, there's also a missing link in that transitional form from the prior creation statement. So there, it's not just one missing link, it's multiple missing links. And the Bible only gives us skipping over the creation story to the highlights. For what it's worth. Yeah, no, it's good. Good input. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any questions? No? You good? Okay. Did everybody get a chance to put your email on the list? If I don't have your email, I'd really like to have it just so I can let you know when the next meetings will be. And uh, yes, sir? No, I didn't say that they do, but... Oh, okay. So dogs turn into cats? I know they have... I know they have completely different perspectives. I mean, I know that. For example, a, a, a dog would say, oh, gee, my master, he cares for me, he feeds me, he waters me, he houses me. He must be a god. And cats say, oh, my master, he cares for me, he feeds me, he waters me, he takes care of me. I must be a god. <laughs> so. Within the fossil record, Avalon and the Kamer, there is no evolution at all in that period of time within the Cambrian shell. Nothing turns in another, and they're all in total, complete form, yeah. just put there overnight. They just show up yes. in, a, in a surprisingly short period of time. There is no record of, of trilobites, pre, prior to trilobites, you know, turning into trilobites. They just show up, boom, they're there. It's amazing, just amazing. Yeah, everything working perfectly. You know, there is another, uh, so in the 80s or so, late 70s, early 80s, you know, this was becoming evident that the fossil record was not substantiating Darwin's ideas. And some of the paleontologists who were, you know, still trying to figure it all out were saying, oh, we know, the answer is called punctuated equilibrium, right? And, and get this, so the idea there is that um, things change very rapidly for a short period of time, and then boom, they stay in a state of stasis for a long period of time, leaving a bunch of fossils behind. And then all of a sudden they change again into something else, and then they stay in that period for a long period of time, leaving a bunch of fossils. But that that change period happened so rapidly that there were, no, there were just not any fossils around to be seen. Does that make sense? Not to me. Yeah. Oh, there's another question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hang on a sec. Hang on. Here we go. Yes, ma'am. It's just clarification. So the slide that showed, you know, the monkeys, yes. you know, to man, whatever. So is that microevolution no. or a no? That would be macroevolution, macro -evolution. where different body plans, uh, you know, basically different body plans come into play. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. The the diagram I showed is all about Darwin's theory of macroevolution. Even, even with the man on the bottom. Yeah, let's bring that back up for just a second. It takes me a second to get through there. Got to hit the right button, though. There we go. Okay, so let's take this one. Can you see that pretty well? So, I like this guy. He's looking at this doll and saying, hey, that's a pretty cool stick. I gotta get me one of them. And this guy's saying, hmm, he's got a cool spear. I need to find something to eat. This is modern man. He's going out looking for some clothes. And this person way back here, 
He's just lying for the ride. He doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I'm just following it. But yeah, that's macro, that's macro evolution. Okay? Any other questions? Oh, Bob, yeah. I don't have a question, but perhaps as a matter of interest, there was a famous trial, uh, the monkey trial, back in 1925. Um, the state of Tennessee had a statute that barred the teaching of evolution in the public schools, and there was some disagreement about the meaning of the word evolution back then. But the city of Dayton in Tennessee decided to call attention um, to the city and have a trial over that, um, having to do with that evolution statute. And there was a fellow named Scopes, who actually was a substitute teacher who was charged uh, with violating the statute by teaching evolution. There's some question about whether he actually did, but they wanted him to admit to it so they could have a trial. <clears throat> Williams Jennings Bryan, was, who was a presidential candidate three times and a secretary of state, was for the prosecution and Clarence Darrell defended uh, Scopes. Well, Darrell was an agnostic, and he wanted to, uh, he was a famous trial lawyer, he wanted at trial to get into the, um, the question of uh, the viability of, of Christianity. He wanted to try the evolution versus the Bible. And he um, said that um, he, want, he, he told the judge that he wanted to get into the questions like, uh, where did uh, Cain find a wife? And, and you know, questions like that question uh, the Bible. But the judge wouldn't allow that. He said, no, all we're going to decide is whether he taught uh, evolution in violation of the statute. Creation, yeah, yeah, and and right, and and that's uh, and that's what he, and that's what he was found guilty of, uh, and, and it went up on appeal, and they never did really argue, you know, evolution and Christianity, the Bible, or anything like that. Just whether he he violated the statute it went up on appeal, and Tennessee Supreme Court said, yeah, well. The state can, it's not a religious matter, the state can do that. And, but they, they reversed the $100 fine that Scopes had because it was uh, excessive back then. And uh, the case basically just went away. Incidentally, um, William Jennings Bryan died five days after the trial was over. I don't know if it, they don't know whether it had anything to do with that or not. I mean, he prevailed as a, as a prosecutor, then in that was 1925. Then in uh, 19 around 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that that issue uh, of a statute that bans evolution is really one that has to do with religion, and and said that a, a state basically couldn't do that. And uh, there were a couple of other states that had a statute like that, but they, which they had to repeal. But uh, that, uh, and this, this monkey, they call it the monkey trial. It was the first trial ever broadcast on national uh, radio. And that, uh, so now you know about the monkey trial. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, let me tell you about next month before you go. Next month, we have Dr. Tom Woodward is going to come and chat with us. And uh, I think he's going to, uh, I'll have a blurb from him that I'll put out on the email so you'll see the topic that he's going to talk about. But uh, if you look up Dr. Tom Woodward on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of videos. 
and he's going to come and he's going to speak right here a month from now. So I hope you guys can make it back and bring some friends. And by the way, bring some non-believing friends. Seriously, right? This isn't a church service. Simply trying to put some information out there, and we'd love to engage non-believers with their with their viewpoint and just kind of understand where they're coming from and not browbeat them, you know, over the head to, that they have to think the way we do. But the, instead, let's just share the evidence, share the data, and let them make up their own minds. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. It was a real joy. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.